Take a Bible, turn to Genesis 1. And um, maybe could somebody get me a bottle of water? Maybe that might help me out a little bit. I don't know, something just, I don't know, flew out of me or jumped in me or something like that. But I've got something hanging down in here and it's sitting right on top of my vocal cords. Huh? Uh, one of those wasps flying around. I'm, I'm not kidding you. Uh, when I recorded uh, today's Watchman broadcast, um, I was getting the camera ready and a wasp flew right by me and landed on that camera. And I'm going, I don't, you know, wasps are dark, black, and all of that camera is black and I don't see it anywhere. And so I did everything I could to get away from that camera. I turned lights on. I got, I just put my tie on. I arranged everything and I'm looking for that wasp. Thank you, JR. I'm looking for that wasp. I don't know where it is. And I am, I'm approaching the camera like with caution. I'm going, I pulled my phone out, turned the flashlight on and I'm shining the light all around that camera going, where's that wasp at? Where's he at? Well, I, got the camera ready and I walked around to sit behind my desk and I noticed it flew and landed on a green wall up there and he stuck out like a wasp on a green wall. I don't remember, I think I had my phone in my hand so I just went pop like that. He's still in that exact same spot <laughs> on that green wall up there and he, and he looks Fine. He looks like he's alive and well, but he's dead as a doorknob. And he's there as a warning to any other wasp up there. Don't come in this room. Because if you go up there, you'll see him. He's still up there. I'm going to leave him there for homecoming. Let everybody online come and see the wasp now that messed with me. All right. Genesis chapter one. <clears throat> Let me get a drink of this. Boy, I appreciate you guys coming out. Roy, it's good to see you tonight. We love you. We're praying for Bonnie. Yes, sir. Okay. We will pray for her. She got someone with her now? Like. Okay. All right. Well, you pray for her and lift her up. Pray for Sister Linda Toomey. You know, these ladies have a, they have a road to go down that God knows the outcome. God knows where it's going to be and God's going to go with them. And uh, if I didn't believe that, I, wouldn't, I would not stand here behind this pulpit ever again. If I believed that God would leave us and forsake us, I would not, I would not support that God. I would not follow that God. We don't do this temporary. This is permanent for us. Yes, Sister Rose. Bernice Whitehead. Yeah. She is going downhill. She's in her last days. She is, uh, and some of you don't know this, but a few years ago, I was looking through the old um, business meeting notes from this church from way back. And I found the book that started this church. It was the, it was the minutes of, of meetings that were, that were held to form Bethel Church. And they, had, they gave the date gave the time and they mentioned that they were forming uh, out of two churches that had kind of split apart during the 60s. They were bringing them back together again to make one church. And so they had a list then of the charter members of the Bethel, back then it was Bethel Free Will Baptist Church. And the, the membership list, I, I was looking at the names, and I knew practically all of those names because I started coming here in 74, and they formed the church at that time in 68, and then they built this building. 
But I noticed that there were two people on there that were still here at the time, and that was Bernice Whitehead and Hazel Waymeyer. And I talked to the people of the church, I talked to the board, and I said, I would love to set aside a special Sunday for those two ladies. They were best friends. They were always here. They would always be sitting in the same spot. They faithfully attended. And as you could tell, as the years went by, they were not able to come as much. And they felt guilty every time they couldn't be here in church. So we set aside a day and we made a plaque in their honor to honor the, the remaining charter members of Bethel Church. And it was Bernice Whitehead and Sister Hazel Waymeyer. Hazel has gone on to be with the Lord. And now it's Sister Bernice's turn. And then after that, to my knowledge, all of the original members of this church that met there in 1968, they're all gone. They're, there's no more left. She's the last one that I'm aware of. And so pray for her that God's grace will shine on her in her remaining days. All right, Genesis chapter 1. Let's go to verse 27 <clears throat> and um, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray, dear God, that you would uh, sustain my voice tonight. I pray, dear God, that the word that goes forth tonight would be a blessing uh, to all of those who listen, all of those who are hearing tonight. Father, it would be a blessing to you. Lord, I would love for my life and my actions, my prayers, my deeds, everything that I do to bless my Heavenly Father. And to bless my Savior. I thank you God. For what you have done. For me. For my life. For the pit you pulled us out of. For the blessing that you've given us. For the mercy. For the love that you've displayed to us. And Father for the gift of the knowledge. That this Bible is right in everything that it says. I pray, dear God, that you would instill it in hearts both old and young. And God, that you would lead this generation of your people, your saints, in the days that we're living in now. Father, we were not around in the days of Adam, days of Moses, days of David, or the days of Jesus and Paul. But we are here now as your people. You've chosen us to live in this time and in this generation and I pray, Heavenly Father, that everything we do would be like Jesus. In the volume of the book, it is written of us to do thy will, Heavenly Father. So, Lord, just instill this word in our hearts. Help us to believe the creation story. Believe it the way you said it. Because this is your world, your creation, your universe. And, Father, I pray, dear God, that as days go by, we would never forget the grace and the mercy and the love that you have displayed to us. The fact that we are your special creation. Though you've made us lower than all of the angels. Father, you exalt man even above them. And you've given us dominion over everything. I pray, dear God, that you would just bless your people tonight. Fill us with knowledge and understanding and wisdom. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. I want to read from verse 27. Down to verse 31, and I'm going to kind of skip over some things. I want to show you something that uh, been on my mind in the last few days. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. By the way, I'm going to throw in here something. God is not a female God. Not a female God. He, he is masculine. And I've, I've heard from Kenneth Copeland, Rick Warren, all of the learned scholars and make-believe Christians say that God is above gender, that God is neither male nor female, that he is spirit, therefore he cannot have a gender the way we have it. And yet... Every single place in the Bible, whether you read it in Hebrew, Greek, Spanish, or English, every place in your Bible declares that God is masculine. He is, you cannot be a female and be a father. Yet, they're working on that. Believe it or not, 
They're working on the process of uniting two women's DNA together to create a child. Sickening. It's wicked. It's abomination. Amen. So you can't be a father and be a woman yet. Okay? But they're working on it. But God, and the reason why I bring this up is that if you retranslate this verse, then you can extract from it this idea that God might be a female. Let me, let me read this to you again. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, him. He, God, created him, Adam. Because then they say that Adam was full, was half male and half female. And that when God created Eve, he took the female out of Adam and then made Eve out of it. Because Adam then, if he was made in the image of God, then that means God was both male and female. And that's, I'm telling you, that's the wrong God. It's another God that's male, female. And all throughout mythology, there are, in practically every civilization, there is a God that is both male and female, Shiva. Shiva the destroyer in Hindu religion is a androgynous God. He's both male and female. Uh, the God Bacchus or Dionysus is a God that is both masculine and feminine. He is the androgynous God. And like I say, there's, there's dozens of others in different myths and different cultures, different religions, where their God is a male-female mixture. Kenneth Copeland... Kenneth Copeland teaches that when God created Adam, he created him both male and female because God was male and female simultaneously. Okay? Rick Warren said, it because someone asked him, and he tweeted this, that he believes that God could very well be both male and female because the way, I don't know what translation he pulled it from, but he pulled it from some goofy Bible that didn't say it the way the King James says it. When you look at the King James, look at it. So God created man in his own image. Man is masculine. His is masculine. In the image of God created he masculine, him masculine. Then male and female created he masculine God them. And they retranslate it to say God created him male and female. That's all you got to do is alter the word order a little bit so that you get out of that, that God, that Adam was male and female at the same time. And here's the setup. Hold, hold your place here. Put your bookmarker in Genesis 1 and go to Revelation 9. Because here's the setup. I believe the Antichrist is going to be androgynous. I believe the anti he, remember, he's another Jesus. He is not the same Jesus. So, when their Jesus shows up wearing a bra, we'll know that's not our Jesus. Amen? So, Revelation 9. When the bottomless pit is opened up, I want you to look at how these devils that come out of that pit are described. In verse... Seven, the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women. So these devils that come up out of the pit are androgynous. They have masculine and feminine appearance. Now, I'm going to throw something else at you. You know, I was just a little boy. Growing up in the 60s, I was born in 66. Before my time, in this country, if you were a man, you had your hair short. If you were a woman, you had your hair long. In the 60s, things started changing. You had men growing hair like women. Okay? Big stink over that. 
Who is it? Merle Haggard wrote about that in Oki from Muskogee. Okay? So, now, you have amongst various peoples, not only in this country, but around the world, you have this appearance where a man will have very long hair, even, in some cases, dreadlocks, or, and this is what I hate, the man bun. You should have heard Joe. Joe's going, ah. <laughs> Joe, I'm with you. I'm just, I have, it's, Paul said, doth not nature itself teach you that it is a shame for a man to have long hair. And I have always, in my nature, my nature is I want my hair short, period. Okay? So it's nature. But I think there is a spirit that is starting to pervade society. The Sikhs, it's a religious group over in India. They're the ones who wear the turbans. And this is real interesting because... They wear a turban because in their religion, it is disrespectful to have your head uncovered between you and God as a man. That is the exact opposite of Bible Christianity. God said, Paul said, that it is a shame for a man to have his head covered if he's praying or prophesying. Gentlemen, remove your hats. Amen? It's a respect to God. But in the Sikh religion, not only do they cover their head with a turban... They also grow their hair. They never cut their hair. They let that hair, when you, if you ever see a guy take his turban off, he's got hair that bloom. Or he's got it in some kind of big ball. That itself has a religious significance to it. And I, I haven't looked into it for a while. I've got notes on it. But anyway, it's the idea that there is a spirit then that with the face of a man and hair of a woman. That's the spirit. And ask yourself, in Revelation 9, where does that spirit come from? Does it come from heaven? It comes out of the pit. Okay? So we're not talking about a preference of how an individual man might like his hair. We're not talking about something that, well, I think that guy looks good with long hair or that guy looks... We're not talking about that. We're talking about a spirit that is pervading the spirit, I believe, the spirit of Antichrist is an androgynous spirit. Sodomite spirit, LGBTQ, whatever. I think that spirit is related to Antichrist. Can I hear somebody say amen? So back to Genesis chapter 1. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So he separated it out. Adam was not made both male and female, and then God extracted the female. That's not how it happened. When God took the rib from Adam, we'll look at this when we get to Genesis 2. When God took the rib from Adam, he made a female out of that rib. He did not extract the female out of Adam. Your Bible does not teach you that. So if you want to make somebody mad on Facebook, post this. Amen? Because they'll get ticked off at you. How dare you? Because I guarantee you, you've got people on your Facebook list that have family members that are sodomites or LGBTQ. And the moment you say anything about it, they come unglued. Okay? All right, now, verse 28. God blessed them. And uh, God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So, aren't you glad that God gave us fish to eat? Amen? Crappie and bass and all that good stuff. Uh, aren't you glad God gave us chicken to eat? Chicken and turkey and if you like quail or dove, anything like that, eat it. And over every living thing... That moveth upon the earth. If you like squirrels, eat squirrels. If you like rabbits, eat rabbits. If you like raccoons, eat raccoons. If you like possums, I've never had it. But if you like possum, eat, who's eaten possum before? One man. Did you? Raise your hand. Okay. Roy, have you ever eaten possum? 
Roy's eat possum. I figured that uh, two old codgers eat, eat possum. Okay? God said you can eat all you want. Amen. Yeah, you, you don't have a taste for it, but he's eating it. I can understand that. All right, now, verse 29. God said, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed, and to it shall be for meat. I'll talk about that in a minute. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. Now, verse 31. Here's what, here's what I'm going to get. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, I haven't talked about this much, but I believe, obviously, I believe that the earth and the heavens are not 13 billion years old. I do not believe that. I do not believe that the earth and the heavens are a billion years old or a million years old or a hundred thousand years old. We can trace the genealogy starting with Adam. God, was, God gave us a very accurate record in Genesis 5 of the genealogy of Adam all the way down to Noah. God kept the genealogy going through Genesis chapter 10. We have the genealogy given so we know where every tribe and every race came from. We know that. And there's been more than one. There was one, I think it was an Anglican bishop by the name of Unger, that um, took the genealogies given in the Bible, and from that he extracted a date for the creation. And he put it roughly 4004 B.C., 4,004 years before the birth of Christ is where he put the creation. Now, what we have is we have a problem with exactly what year Christ was born. There's differences. And, when, and sometimes it looks, the evidence contradicts one another. I think God isn't really concerned with us knowing exactly what year it is. But I know that if God said that Adam lived 930 years, I believe Adam lived exactly 930 years. If God said that Noah lived 600 years, and then in the 600 year of his life the flood came, then I believe exactly that. And so I believe the genealogies of the Bible to be correct, and I believe that they give us then a, an estimate of how old this earth is. And I think it matters, and we're going to get into that, when you look at Genesis chapter 2, the first three verses, we're going to talk about the meaning of the Sabbath day. And I think it matters how old this earth is in relation to God's promise of a Sabbath day. Okay? I think it means something. Um... There was a book that came out a few years ago. I don't know the author, don't know the title of the book. But it introduced this idea that rather than Adam being the first man ever created, that this person who said they were a Christian and believed the Bible, said that man evolved from monkeys or apes or gorillas or whatever, and evolved, and that Adam wasn't actually the first man that ever lived, Adam was the first man that God made a covenant with. And we'll examine how wrong that is when we get into Genesis chapter 2. But it's just wrong is what it is. If Adam, and I'm going to touch on it, if Adam was the first man that God made a promise to or a covenant with, that means that there were men who lived and died before Adam, which violates... Scripture, because the Bible says that by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So if, if Adam was the first man that God made a covenant with, that he broke, then there has to be before Adam no death. 
Nobody and no thing died before Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, which is impossible. Okay? And, and understand this. When God, in Genesis 2, when God made that deal, that arrangement with Adam, there was nothing that died before that. When God created everything, He created it to live and to continue on. Death was not brought into the world, ever. It was only after Adam sinned that death was brought into the world. God had to kill an, a an animal to cover Adam and Eve with their skins. Okay? So death was brought into the world when Adam sinned. But here's what I'm getting at. I think there's evidence, real tangible evidence, that promotes this idea that the earth is actually not a hundred thousand years old or a million years old or a billion years old or ten billion years old. Okay? So let's look at that. Number one, the oldest tree in the world is a bristlecone pine. For some reason, these trees live thousands of years. The oldest tree ever found, bristlecone pine, was only 4,300 years old. Okay? That takes you back, they call it the Joshua tree, takes you back roughly to the time of Moses and Joshua. Okay? Now, the Barrier Reef, Australia, Great Barrier Reef, in fact, any coral reef, they know how long it takes for a coral reef to grow. They've measured it. When we went on that cruise, remember that island that that hurricane had destroyed? We went visiting that island. We were told that part of the cruise package people used to get was they would visit the coral reef at that island. No more. Because that Category 5 hurricane not only wiped that island off, but it destroyed the coral there. And they said it's going to take hundreds of years for that coral to grow back. They can measure coral and know how long it takes for it to grow to a certain size or a certain height. And the oldest known coral reef is only 4,200 years old. There's no coral or older than that. Now, it was about 5,000 years ago that the flood occurred. The flood probably would have destroyed every coral reef around the world, taking then thousands of years to build all that coral back up. That coral reef is only 4,200 years old. Here's another one, population of the earth. In 1810, there was only about 1 billion people that lived on the earth. So in less than 200 years, the population hit 6 billion. Now you think about this. If, if the earth and, the, and humans, let's say humans have been on this earth for, what, 200,000 years. Let's say 200,000 years, humans, the way we are now, if we believe in evolution... Humans, the way we are now, have lived 200,000 years on this earth. What would the population be to how, to, from 200,000 years ago until now? What would the population be if it's grown by 5 billion people in 200 years? You see what I'm saying? There would be no room left for anybody, or there would be this mass wiping out of humans, and it's, it's never happened. So this fits the biblical chronology perfectly as the current population started about 4,000 years ago. Or I think, let's see, I think five. Four or five, I, I'm, I think 5,000 years ago was the flood and then the Tower of Babel. And I got something about the Tower of Babel here in a minute. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field. Studies over the past 140 years show a constant decay rate in the Earth's magnetic field. At this rate, in as few as 25,000 years ago, the earth would have been unable to support life because the heat from the electric current. Okay? Uh, evidence for a young earth. The water in the ocean contains 3.6% dissolved minerals, giving the ocean its salt. 
Salt, composed of the elements, sodium and chlorine, is the primary mineral. For years, scientists have been measuring the amount of sodium in the oceans and have found that an estimated 457 million tons are deposited into the oceans every year, while only 122 million tons leave the ocean via numerous methods. So here's what they're saying. Given the current amount of salt in the oceans, the data strongly favors a recent creation and a global flood. Not oceans that are hundreds or millions of years old. The salt content proves it. Let me give you another one. The moon. And this is what we were talking about in the office. The moon, it's been known. When Armstrong and Aldrin went to the moon, and yes, they went to the moon. Now I'm going to start that. They put an instrument on the moon that was a laser reflector. And the scientists on Earth shoot a laser beam to that reflector on the moon. And then it calculates how long it took for that laser to reach the moon and send the data back. It's like a radar. An officer uses radar. He bounces a radar wave off of you. And how fast that radar wave comes back tells him how fast you're going. Right? Right? It's the same process. We have now an accurate measurement of how far the moon is. And what's happening is the moon is getting farther and farther away from the earth. Okay? So, it's been known for a long time that the moon should be receding from our planet. The Apollo lunar program in the 60s allowed scientists to measure this process with great precision. Over the last 40 years or so, the moon's average distance has increased by roughly 1.5 inches every year. And every year the moon moves away from the earth an inch and a half. Every year. Okay? So if you did the math, if you go backwards, the moon is moving toward the earth an inch and a half every year. If you go back, let's say, a million years, the moon is too close to the earth. And by the way, the theory about where the moon came from before we went to the moon was the moon ripped off Earth. It like tore off when the Earth was forming and made the Pacific Ocean and ended up floating out in space. When they went to the moon, Joe, and brought back the moon rocks and analyzed the rocks, they said, that moon never came from this planet. Science wasn't right okay but the idea is the moon's getting farther and farther away and at some point it would have been too close now i'm going to throw this in as well this is the landing pad of the apollo 11 okay we're talking about something about this big they put these big landing pads on the lunar excursion module and on the bottom of these pads was a rod about that long about two feet that rod on the end of it had a sensor so that when the lunar module touched the moon's surface, it notified them in the module, notified the two astronauts and Houston. And if you watch, you know, them, them playing the Apollo 11 moon landing back and forth, they, you, you can hear what they were saying. And at some point they said contact light. What that means is that rod that came down touched the moon's surface. And that rod then was meant to break away so that it wasn't holding up like one corner of the lunar module. Here's what I'm trying to get at. There was a lot of scientists who said the moon is millions of years old. It has no weather on it. It has no way for anything that lands on it, wherever it lands, that's where it is. It doesn't have wind. It doesn't have rain. So all of these meteor impacts that hit the moon, when it smashes into dust particles, it stays right there. There were scientists that were legitimately afraid that when the lunar module landed on the moon and Neil Armstrong stepped off, that they were going to sink down two feet of dust and get stuck. That's why those pads were that big. And if you watch... Armstrong coming off, coming out of Apollo 11, walking and going down the ladder, he's tethered. He's got a, a cable that's connecting his suit to inside the ship because there was fear that they were stepping into millions of years worth of dust. 
there was only that much dust on the lunar surface. So that much dust means that the moon is not as old as they thought it was. Okay? And there's all kinds of other things, but I believe that the earth is only 6,000 years old. Uh, let me give you this. Turn to Genesis 11. Genesis 11. Genesis 11 is just a few years after the flood. We have the flood. We have Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the father in, the, in Genesis 10. You have, the, you have the 72 families of the earth, 72 tribes. Coming from the three sons of Noah, you have three primary races of men, Caucasoid, Negroid, Mongoloid, and you have three sons of Noah. I think they're connected. So then you have the 72 families in Genesis 10, and then in Genesis 11, we find out in verse 1 that the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. That after the flood, everybody in the world all spoke the same language. There's a lot of speculation on what that was. Some say it was Sanskrit. Some say it was Sumerian. Some say it was Hebrew. I think it was Hebrew, but I can't prove it. God doesn't tell us what language it is, so it doesn't matter. Okay? If God's silent, we should be silent too. Okay? But anyway, we know that everybody spoke the same language. And then we know what happened in Genesis 11, verse uh, 7. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So on one day... God instantaneously changed 72 different families' languages. Changed them so that these, this guy and this guy are talking and now they can't understand one another because they're both speaking a different language. And naturally what happens is everybody speaking this language congregates together and everybody speaking that language congregates together and they all divide up based upon their language. So now, here is a, a book on etymology and how uh, scientists understand where language comes from. It says the earliest direct evidence of language in the form of writing is no more than about 5,000 years old. 5,000 years old. That was just after the flood in Genesis 7. And that brings you to Genesis 11 when God confounded the languages. So there's evidence. We're not just dumb people who are just making fairy tales up and believing them. There's evidence that says this earth is not as old as everybody says it is. You can believe what God said. All right. Now, let's go back to Genesis 1. I'll show you a couple more things, and then we're going to move on to Genesis 2. Genesis 1. Notice in Genesis 1, verse 29, God said, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. The word meat means what you eat. Meat is what you eat. Meat doesn't, in the Bible, doesn't always mean like steak and chicken and hot dogs. Meat is what you eat. Before the flood, everybody ate a vegan, vegetarian diet. Before the flood. Which is why I think we have an appendix. An appendix we're told is a thing that we don't use anymore. They say at one time the appendix was there to help us sort of like, I don't know, maybe a gizzard. But it was something, you know, chickens and some birds have gizzards. What do they use a gizzard for? What's a gizzard for? It breaks up all that seed. They eat rocks and pebbles and it gets in their gizzard and that, those pebbles grind all that seed up. Okay, helps them digest it. At some point, they said that humans' diet was primarily a vegetable or a seed diet. And the appendix was used to help digest all of that roughage. 
or whatever. After the flood, turn to Genesis 9. After the flood, now our diet is different. Now the appendix has no use. In Genesis 9, verse 1, God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. This is the second time God has said this. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. Notice what he's saying now. And every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. So now, and I'm not quite sure why, but now God is telling man, instead of just eating grains, leaves, fruits, vegetables, nuts, Instead of just eating vegetable, now you can eat animal. Now you can eat chicken and squirrel and turkey and possum and beef and rattlesnake and locusts and, and people eat locusts. Now you can eat those things. So now there's a difference in the diet. But notice this. God has a restriction here. Verse 4. But the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. God said, don't eat blood. I think there's a reason why. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. Because what is it about blood that God says about blood? It's the life. Okay? And to this day, our practices, when we slaughter an animal, when I kill a deer, Caleb, when we kill a deer, what do we do? Drain the blood. Get the blood out of it. Now, it's not possible to get every blood cell out of the meat. Not possible. But drain that blood. Most butcher practices and slaughterhouse practices, before, when they kill the animal, they drain that blood. There are certain places around the world where they save the blood, they turn the blood, they drink the blood, eat the blood, make blood sausage, which I don't think you ought to eat. Okay? It's gross. Why would you do that? Okay? But that's what they do. But God said, don't do it. We have that, and then we have, in Acts chapter 15, we have the Jerusalem Council telling us the exact same thing. Among four things that we as the Gentile Christians are not to do, one of them was, don't drink the blood of any species. Don't eat it, don't drink it. Okay, there's something about the blood. But anyway, the flesh, with, verse 4 again on Genesis 9, the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. Surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of man, of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Verse 6, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God made he man. Understand something. Whoever's listening to this, whatever, if you don't like anything I say, you may not like this either. God is the one who instituted capital punishment for the taking of a man's life. God did. He repeated it in the law that he gave to Israel. Jesus never contradicted that law, and I believe, biblically, that it's right and righteous to take the life of a man who has illegally taken the life of another man. Amen. Amen. Capital punishment. The by, God said this before Abraham, God said this before Moses, before Christ, before the church, he said it as soon as Noah and his family come off the ark. God gives them a law and he says, if anybody slays anybody else, they are to be slain. Because why? For in the image of God made he man. God even said, if a beast kills a man. You know, it was written in the, in the law of Moses that if you're...
That includes murder. That includes manslaughter. That includes abortion. God made man special. God made man in his image. And God said, I don't care if it's another man. I don't care if it's a beast. If they kill a man, they are to be killed. Turn to Psalm 8. I'm going to throw in a couple of things. I'm going to let you go because this is really the gist of where I'm going. I hate to cut it off now. Psalm 8. Boy, I like... See, if you hang around me much, you know I like certain things. And I grew up in the age of Apollo and the space shuttle. I watched men go to the moon. I watched men. I can remember in first grade, they brought in a TV set. I can't remember what it would have been. 73, 74, somewhere around in there. 72, somewhere around in there. But I remember watching one of the uh, Apollo landings on the moon. Okay? And then I remember when they were firing off the space shuttle. That was, I mean, I loved that. I loved outer space. I love watching, I love knowing about the planets and the stars. That's my interest. I want you to read this. David said, when I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the Son of Man, that thou visitest him. Do you think, let's kind of ask you, Jeff, do you think that there are people like us living on other planets billions of light years away? I don't either. I don't even think there's people not like us living on planets billions of light years away. I think... And see, this is where everything's going. You've got to pay attention to how people are talking now. Because now that scientists know how to spot planets around different stars, we didn't know that 20 years ago. Now we know how to do it. Now they're saying there's planets everywhere. Planets everywhere. And now they're saying, of course, they have to be inhabited. That's a setup. It's a setup to get us to think about people visiting here from another place. Okay? And God did not make all of those stars with all those planets for other people. He did not make them for aliens. He made them for us. He made them for us. We are God's unique creation in this whole universe. There's not another Jesus on another planet somewhere. The Mormons might believe that. I don't believe that. Look at verse 5. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Isn't that true? Angels can go wherever they want to. Can we? No. Angels can walk through walls. We can't do that. Angels can fly. We can't fly. We can't go to outer space. We can't do this. We can't do that. And yet, thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and has crowned him with glory and honor. Thou hast made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands and has put all things under his feet. All sheep. And oxen, yea, and all the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. God has taken man, who he's made lower than the angels, and God's given us a crown, and one of these days we're going to be above the angels. We're going to rule over angels. God says that man is unique. Psalm 144, very quickly. Psalm 144, blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him, or the son of man that thou makest account of him? Man is like vanity, his days are as a shadow that passeth away. And the point of this is, who, are, who am I? Who are you? Who are any of us? God made us lower than his highest creation, all the stars of heaven. God put us under them. And yet one of these days, God's going to crown us 
and we'll be over them. So, all you young people, listen to this. Turn to Ecclesiastes 12, and I'm going to let you go. Ecclesiastes 12, it's the last place tonight. Ecclesiastes 12. So, you can be taught that you guys here, you guys, you families online, bring your kids to listen to this. Some of you are homeschooled, which means that you're being taught that you were created by God. The alternative to that is some godless, immoral teacher, science teacher at a public school or a public university telling you that it's dumb to believe in a creator that we evolved over millions of years and we're nothing unique and special above any other thing that exists. We're just an animal among animals. And that's all we are. What has that teaching done to our society? Now we're treating humans like they're animals. Now we're treating, in fact, the liberals will treat animals better than humans. They'll say, save the whales, kill the babies. Ecclesiastes 12, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While you're young, you're to be taught that you were created by God. Verse 7, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. Young people. Whatever you set your eyes on in this world that you think you want, you think you desire, you think you lust after, whatever it is that you think will bring you happiness, it won't. Solomon knew it. We learned it. We found out this Bible was right. We found out what Solomon knew. That everything that we've gained or accomplished in this world passes away. So the Blues won the Stanley Cup. In a year, that'll be forgotten. Somebody else will win it. Somebody else will be eating spaghetti out of it or whatever they do with it. It will be nothing anymore. And it's all vanity. It's all gone. And then verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment Listen to this, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Young people, God always brings out the secrets. Some, let's hear some adults say amen. amen. God always, and he judges our works. So the purpose of your life, if you want God to crown you above all of his creation, fear God, keep his command. You know what his commandments are? This. Keep it. You grow up, your faith gets challenged. Right, Courtney? And then you think, mom and daddy was wrong, that Bible's wrong. Then you end up running back to it. We've all done it. This Bible's right. Amen.